Hello, this is J.R. Spencer from Spencer Music and Artist Development, and I'm located in Belmont Shore area of Long Beach, California, and I'm a vocal coach that coaches singers in the industry, uh, specifically those that are looking to be recording artists and to uh, tour and make albums and, and so forth. And I often get asked, well, how do I break into the industry and what are some of the things I should know or look into if I'm trying to make a successful career? And a little bit about me, I've been in the uh, business for, oh my gosh, over 30 years. Um, I, after I you know, got my degrees in uh, both voice and piano, got uh, double masters uh, from Cal State Fullerton. I also studied at USC and went on to get my PhD through London College of Music. Um, being in the industry uh, for 30 years, I've seen a lot of trends and a lot of things change. And those are some of the things I kind of want to address to help uh, singer-songwriters and vocalists make it in the industry. For those who might be interested too, um, at the end of this video is my contact for my uh, artist development firm. And besides myself being a coach, I also have some wonderful uh, industry artists that also work with me uh, to create uh, wonderful package deals for different um, artists that, again, are trying to make it. Okay, so let's get started. These are the 10 top um, things you should know to be successful as a singer in the industry. And here's number one. Okay, so number one is that the best vocalists out there always study with a coach. Now that goes with, you know, obviously without saying, but you'd be surprised how many singers I see that say, I'm going to go on American Idol or I'm going to make it in the industry and they have no vocal training. So obviously number one is a having a vocal coach. Now, when looking for a good vocal coach, you, uh, you want to work with someone who usually has degrees and has industry experience. Um, the industry is changing considerably, and so what's happening now is it's not just about correct singing, is that the sounds out there in all the different genres of uh, recording right now are edgy. Uh, we're, uh, the industry is looking for more interesting voices, but sometimes what happens, is, especially in like alternative rock, or in specific genres like that, is that people don't know how to sing without hurting their voice. And so a good coach can teach you how to have that edgy rock sound or to have the incredible high falsetto or things that are popular right now without injuring your voice. And that's really, really important because a lot of good singers will just start performing and sing on, uh, singing on stage and then their voice is thrashed after a couple of years. So a good coach is going to work with you on several things. One is specifically breath, how to uh, breathe diaphragmatically um, and circle breathe as needed uh, with, and there's many other techniques to make sure you have plenty of stamina and we're not hearing the breath when you're singing. Uh, one thing, uh, like when I was uh, doing auditions for uh, contestants for American Idol, uh, one thing we notice is as soon as someone walks in and, they, and we have them sing a cappella and they do a phrase, if we hear that <gasps> between the uh, phrase of the song, then we know they're not um, a accomplished singer yet and they have work. So breath is very, very important and I stress that I make all my singers, uh, I have over, over 20, 30 exercises I do just in breath alone for also specific times a year. Uh, the season's like right now in California today, just speaking of which, it's actually 105 degrees outside, and that's brutal on the voice. And so uh, there's specific tricks uh, that I teach as um, specifically for that on breath. The other is resonance, and that means the placement and quality of your sound. Um, I'm going to just change my resonance for a second. A lot of guys that are singers in California uh, specifically tend to sing or talk in the back of their throat. I'm going to do that. <clears throat> like, dude, I'm from California. 
See, it's all back in here. And obviously, as I'm singing back there or talking back there, it's going to be very swallowed sound. And that can cause all kinds of problems on the voice as like notes on the chords and so forth. Um, another specifically for sopranos I see a lot in tenors is uh, singing where the resonance is not placed right in, um, and singing on the back of the throat uh, and breathy. So we you know, singing like this with a lot of air and talking like this. Obviously incorrect and it's going to cause a lot of vocal problems. Another one I see mostly uh, from people that are uh, from the East Coast is tightness in the jaw and in the tongue. And if I'm like from Boston and I'm talking like this and I'm singing like that, it's locked jaw, locked tongue, going to obviously cause some problems. So uh, that's the second thing is resonance. Third, of course, is uh, musicianship and styling. And a lot of singers, too, also rely on an accompanist to teach them their music. And so one thing that's really important for all singers is to be able to read. Uh, industry singers should be able to read any, any lead chart, any um, harmony work, so forth. And uh, it's amazing how many singers try to record or get into the industry or do their first album with not even knowing how to read one note of music. So, I mean, it seems like that would go without saying, but you would su be surprised now with uh, such things as GarageBand and things that are computerized with beat porting and things. It's so easy to put tracks together, and yet this, the actual musicianship is not there to back it up. Okay, a lot of times. So that's one thing I stress uh, with a coach that you, besides your uh, studying voice and studying specific styling and uh, and repertoire, and also including all types of repertoire. Meaning, if you're um, a pop singer, you should be able to sing jazz, classical, a little bit of everything. Uh, really helps in the industry. Um, and then also being able to read music. So uh, my students that I work with all are in specific theory composition programs, as well as ear, ear development to develop intonation. So uh, of course that's the first, and but that's the most important. I see so many artists out there that really have a lot of raw talent that they never really get with a coach to study. Um, also, it should be stated, too, that um, a lot of academic coaches are great within universities, but one challenge I see with a lot of university coaches is they're academic. So a lot of times university coaches won't work on industry or uh, artist development of a specific singer's styling, uh, per se. So that's just one thing to think about when choosing a coach. Okay, let's move on to number two. Thank you. Okay, we're back. One thing I cannot stress enough is health maintenance of the voice and just general health care. Um, you would think this would, would go without saying, but I am truly amazed uh, how many singers uh, out there know very little about taking care of their health and of their voice. So I'm going to give you a few tips that you can use that will hopefully keep your voice well into your 90s. Um, a little bit about my background again, you know, I come from a, a, a family of singers and my mother uh, was a New York City opera singer and my dad was a country western performer and my mom uh, just turned 80 years old and she still's got a beautiful voice, high F's above C, sounds amazing. And one thing um, I would say about singers, test of time obviously, is that the best singer should, of course, not smoke, that goes without saying, and also um, should avoid alcohol and soft drinks. Now, a lot of people say, well, soft drinks, how could that hurt my voice? But a lot of that corn syrup and carbonation is really hard on the voice. Um, another thing that is very difficult uh, and can cause vocal and health problems is dairy. Now. My belief, and I don't saying everybody has to do it, but I tell my singers if you really want to have a lasting career uh, as a singer, go vegan. And uh, I personally, that's just my personal belief, but I believe that plant-based diet uh, is so much healthier for the voice, um, or at least eliminating dairy. I found a lot of students, you know, I've been, you know, I see, uh, come to me, and so many. Uh, 
you know, complain of asthma, allergies. You know, when the Santa Ana winds pick up in California, I see so many people considerably congested and so forth. And that simple act of eliminating dairy can really help your voice. So that's one thing I believe in. And if you are going to eat uh, meat uh, and do that, stick with the things that are more oily because they nourish the lungs, like uh, salmon, for example, and sardines and things like that are the healthier foods uh, for the lungs uh, specifically. Um, and then also besides diet, um, one thing I definitely recommend doing is neti potting the sinuses daily. Um, that's nasal irrigation. You can pick this up at any health food store. And they're just some little gentle salts that you put in a, a neti pot, which is a little bit like a genie lamp and you clean out your sinuses. And I do that three times a day. And, you know, I literally start teaching at seven in the morning and sometimes I'm going all the way to seven and eight at night. I have, very rarely do I have any vocal challenges uh, from those simple acts of diet and obviously uh, neti potting. One thing I also recommend too is if possible, if you do have uh, any health issues and you're on medications, to seek out holistic health practitioners. Uh, I myself uh, prefer acupuncture and Chinese herbs, but there's all kinds of mo new modalities out there that have really helped uh, singers break through uh, consistent challenges that, that arise. So I would definitely look into that. Another thing that I uh, believe in, um, also as a licensed nutritionist uh, and a yoga instructor, is yoga. And I believe that uh, yoga and breathing and uh, stretching uh, will keep your body limber uh, and keep you uh, flexible for uh, the demands of the industry. And a, a lot of people are not prepared for that. They think, oh, it's going to be exciting be, being an industry singer. But then when you're doing you know, seven shows a week and traveling and uh, going into studios and then doing press releases, it's hard on the body. And so you want to be in tip-top shape and looking your very best um, at all times. So uh, those are some simple things to do. I also believe that, you know, it is image in this industry. And so obviously uh, anything you can do to take care of your hair, your skin, your body, exercise, all that's very, very important. And I can't stress it enough. And obviously if you look at singers that have been around in the industry for years, uh, you know, I'm just going to throw people out like Madonna, you know, started in 79 and she's still going strong. And the, the, the singers that are always on the charts are the ones that do really uh, look at those things to take care of your body. They're not the ones out uh, smoking and drinking. And another thing to do, too, uh, is to just look at artists. Uh, one thing, I, I, I work with a lot of jazz artists specifically, um, and I'd say, well, look at someone like, Frank Sinatra in the beginning of his career, uh, singing with like actual Strodel and Nelson Riddle Orchestra uh, in the 40s and how smooth and velvety his voice was in his vocal control. And then look at him towards the end of his life after, you know, all the booze basically, you know, in Vegas and so forth. And not only did his voice drop like four and five pitches, but you hear the raspiness. And uh, that happens with a lot of singers, especially with jazz singers, you know, so I use that as an example um, all the time. Like one of my favorite singers who I actually wrote a book on is Julie London. And again, if you look at Julie London in 1955 with her first album and then look at her at her last album around 75, huge difference in the voice and the vocal control. So obviously, again, health is one of the number one components of having uh, a successful career in the industry. Okay, let's move on. Okay, number three is also a very, very important one for all artists that are trying to break into the industry, is to have a professional, well thought out, put together website. Now, here's the problem with most artists. They say, well, I can't afford it uh, because, you know, let's face it, most web designers out there are thousands of dollars to do uh, sites. And in addition, most web designers are working for um, corporations and businesses, not necessarily artists. So they don't have an artistic eye on uh, how to present an artist and 
really show the talents of that artist off well. So um, what we teach here uh, at Spencer Music is how to do uh, incredibly cost-effective websites, but also some of the secrets of the industry where the website um, will connect into uh, free vouchers, uh, for example, that will allow you to put albums up uh, on CD Baby and iTunes, everything complimentary, which can save you literally, if you're doing two to three albums a year, can save you like five to six hundred dollars. So that's pretty cool. And also uh, connects into some form of a uh, mailer list and an automa automation of that. So uh, most, uh, so you know, for an artist's website or singer's website, you obviously want to have a welcome page and you want your fonts, colors, and everything to work as one unit for the artist. So uh, how you present yourself as an artist uh, when a, a person sees you is going to affect if they're going to buy your album or not. So obviously that makes sense. Um, in addition, you should have like a dossier or a resume or a bio up there. Uh, you should be able to have a full store. So if you have albums, books, merchandise, t-shirts, you know, whatever it is, you want to be able to sell those from your website. So that's very important. You also want your website to connect into all uh, new social media. Uh, because it's a numbers game. So uh, you should have a YouTube channel, you should have Facebook uh, fan page, you should have Twitter, uh, you know, there's so many other ones, you know, I, it'll take me forever to go over, but you know, you get the idea, that's very important. You also want to have a, uh, you know, a contact page, and uh, you want to have a gallery where you could present photos of your performances and so forth. So a um, you know, a professional looking website can go a long way to starting your career and getting you out there and looking professional. And in fact, nowadays, uh, most uh, agents in the industry are going digital. So it used to be back like when I started, I was working with bands in the 80s. In fact, uh, you know, uh, I went to high school at, at Edison High School in Huntington Beach and my first band, uh, I went to school with Scott Weiland of Stone Temple Pilots and I was performing uh, around the time of all those 80s bands that we were starting up at the same time, Berlin, Missing Persons, and so forth. So uh, when we were starting up, you we had resume and we had a cassette tape, you know, and that was sort of the industry back in those days. It's changed considerably now. So meaning the industry now is all website, digital interface, MP3 albums, and that kind of thing. So you have to be up on that. And it is good to learn a little basics of web design. So even if you have someone design your website for you, uh, you can go in and maintain it and add blogs, uh, you know, add little teasers of where, uh, what's coming up to be able to add a uh, calendar of where you're performing, those kind of things. And if you're new and you're like, well, I don't know if I'm ready to perform yet. Um, I don't know if I should, you know, invest in a website. Absolutely. Because, you know, it's, that's the motivator. If you are, like, putting together a website and you have a beautiful presentation, people are going to be talking about you, well, when, when are you going to be performing? And that usually propels people forward to make those uh, connections in the industry that get them out performing and get them noticed. So website, so, so important. And um, the, hopefully those are some little tips that will help you. Let's move on. Okay, um, number four uh, that's very important is obviously with uh, all the technology that's happening in the last few years, um, social networking and uh, is so, so important. And it's about, it's sort of a numbers game. So besides your website, you need to have a YouTube channel uh, where you could put uh, videos of your work or um, commercials for your albums or like what I'm doing here, some little, you know, if you're a vocal teacher, a little, um, you know, some, uh, you know, little teaching lessons and things uh, that will allow people to know what you do. So that's very important. So besides YouTube, Obviously, you know, everybody uses Facebook, so you can have, besides your, your personal page, you should have a, a singer-artist page or a teacher's page, a singer-songwriter page, depending on what you do. 
and uh, link that in again with your website and with your YouTube. Everything starts working uh, together as a unit. Also, you should have Twitter and some of the uh, other social networks that you know that kind of goes without saying. In addition to media social work, uh, uh, you know, networks uh, online is just networking in general is so important. And so one of the first things I do with my artists is teach them the art of everywhere you go is your opportunity to make a sale of yourself as an artist. And so even if you're just waiting in line for uh, herbal tea at Starbucks, don't drink all that crap uh, Frappuccino stuff, uh, but you know, if you're if you're in line there and you hear someone talking about music, it's a perfect opportunity to turn around and say, "Oh, I'm a singer. Here's my business card." You know, uh, so networking is very very important. Okay, let's move on. Okay, one of my favorite um, little secrets of the industry that I think all singers should know about is commission referral. Now, what that means is that, here's an example. Um, let's say I'm trying to fill up my studio with a few new students, and I tell my vocalist, hey, you know, I have a couple of more uh, morning openings, and if you happen to hear of someone that might want lessons, I will be happy to give you a 20% commission off that student's first month or a complimentary half hour. Now, for artists in the industry, that's pretty cool. So that, you know, like, give you an idea, 20% of, uh, you know, that could be, uh, you know, $60 in someone's pocket, or that could be, you know, complimentary lesson. And this is really great specifically for young artists that are trying to break in that might be on limited funds. So a lot of people say, well, I want to study with an industry coach regularly, but, you know, I can't come up with, with uh, tuition. So, but yet they have friends, right? So if you tell your friends, then those referral fees add up and, and sometimes uh, it's a good way to get lessons comped or it's a good way to make a little extra money. Now, in addition to that as a teacher or referring out, um, uh, commissions can also be uh, for putting another artist in. So let's say you're a singer and you're booked uh, to sing at a wedding or something on the weekend and your agent calls or someone calls you and says, hey, um, I have another engagement uh, can you work that night and you can't then you call another singer and then you take 20% off getting them the job because you're doing them a favor you see so this is really how the industry works and believe it or not you can make a whole living just off commissions you know a lot of people don't realize that so I have a lot of high school students that are just learning this and I'm really proud I have one gentleman uh, that works with me who's a Broadway singer and this kid has made $2,000 in commissions uh, for me uh, and, my, and my teachers as well as for other singers. And he's 16 years old. So, you know, when you think about it, how many 16-year-olds are making $2,000 a month, you know, when they're still in high school? Pretty great. So that can be anybody. You see what I'm saying? And so referral commissions is really excellent. And also don't rule out bartering. So, for example, uh, I have a singer uh, who is also a fashion designer. She does, in fact, she made the shirt for me, actually. You know, she's a designer in uh, Hollywood here that I really like. And so she says, hey, I go, I love your design. She goes, well, if I uh, give you some of my designs, could I get a couple of uh, free coachings? I said, absolutely, you know, helps me, helps her. Great. Okay, so that's something you can use in the industry. And don't rule this out with other things you might need. Um, I have a singer right now who uh, just had her tonsils out and she's having some a little bit of challenges. And uh, I sent her to an acupuncturist and it wasn't covered under her insurance. And she bartered with her uh, acupuncturist and got like free treatments. I mean, how cool is that? You know, so what I'm getting at is that's something that, uh, you know, a lot of industry uh, artists do, but a lot of newbies, I would call, you know, not, may, might not necessarily know that. So definitely make use of that. And uh, it's a really great tool. Okay, let's move on.
Okay, very important, obviously, recording artists, okay? And most singers, you know, we want to get our albums out there. But here's the deal, the industry's so different now. And uh, used to be, uh, you know, record companies and you would uh, put out CDs and so forth. Now everything is digital MP3 albums. And here's the thing, is to be honest, let's face it, most people aren't buying albums like they used to. Why? Well, we have digital radio now. We have digital streaming. And so a lot of people think, well, if I can go to somewhere like Pandora and just stream exactly what I want to listen to, why should I buy an album? And so album sales are down. It doesn't mean you can't make a living making albums. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is the albums serve a different purpose than they did several years ago. Um, you know, again, back in the day when I was recording as both, uh, you know, a pop artist as well as a classical artist, I'm a concert pianist, and I would record. You know, we go into a studio, we'd be under a label, and then you put out albums and CDs. But now, anybody, this is good though, anybody can put out an album internationally very inexpensively. In fact, um, this is what I teach, is how if you're a new artist, can you do uh, a phenomenal album that's going to get some sales for under a thousand? A lot of people say that's impossible. It's not. And that's something I teach. Um, but anyway, uh, with having an MP3 uh, album done, uh, one thing that we need to know is that if you are a vocalist, if you write original material, then obviously you don't have to pay royalties on what is called cover tunes. Now, a cover tune is any tune that has been in uh, print since 1923. And that's really confusing to people. Like, I know uh, I have a jazz artist, like, well, I'm going to be singing Gershwin. That's like almost 100 years old now. And yet, it, they had to pay very, very high royalty rights. Now, with royalties, uh, it gets expensive now because uh, you have to get royalties on every song you record that is, uh, you know, a cover, like I said, is cover tune. So um, that can add up. To give you an example, I had a student that wanted to do an album of all cover tunes, and I said, don't do it. And he didn't listen to me, add 15 songs just to um, get the licensing to do 15 songs for 100 sellable downloads was over $500. That's expensive. And so that meant his return on a CD was less than a dollar a CD or, or MP3 album he's making. So I always tell artists you want to, uh, this is your opportunity if you're a singer-songwriter to do new material, throw in a few cover songs, but be uh, you know careful what you, you throw in and make sure it's going to be something that's commercial. Um, that's one thing I teach too, is knowing what is commercial, what is going to sell and why, and knowing your market. Um, another thing with MP3 albums is the whole packaging, obviously. So you want to have a beautiful uh, album cover, you want the songs to work as a unit. I believe in the idea of the concept album. And I see this happening so often where a lot of singers do different styles and they try to do too much on an album. Wrong. Totally wrong. Like I know a singer uh, locally here, a ph phenomenal singer, but she's got everything on her album from, uh, you know, Bossa Nova, Sergio Mendez kind of things to 1940s torch song, to a tango, to a country song. I'm like, well, what does this all mean? You know, and that is where a lot of singers go wrong. So you want to make sure that if uh, that everything's working as a unit, and that's very important. Once you do an album, the trick is how to get international sales and how to sell it inexpensively, and that's something I, I teach. Uh, another thing that a lot of people um, don't think about is it's actually the main thing too now with albums is you want to get them uh, into all the streaming sites and you want to uh, be able to get on the radio and to get into podcasts so people start to know you internationally. So even if you don't make a lot of royalty from your album, you're getting known. Um, I find it amazing myself. Just recently I did an album only about four months ago. It's called Nightfall, a uh, jazz piano album. And um, it only was out for three months and it already hit number one in parts of Australia. And I was like, how could that even be? I just released it. And the reason why was all streaming stations. And apparently I've been... Uh, I've done a lot of radio shows in, in Australia with a lot of great people 
and um, got you know some radio play and some interviews, and that led to people knowing about me. So I got played on all the radio stations down there. So it could be as simple as one little connection you make with a podcast, and all of a sudden, you know, everything opens up for you with your sales and uh, getting you know hired all over the world. Okay, let's move on. Okay, very important. Um, singers need to embrace industry change. Uh, the industry is completely changing day to day. And a lot of people, especially artists that have been in the industry for a while, uh, may not want to change and then they wonder why they're, they can't find work or they wonder why uh, their albums aren't selling. So you keeping abreast of what's happened currently in the industry and specifically in the industry where you live because uh, you know every city's different um, I have uh, I do Skype lessons too so I have uh, you know coaching where I have artists that are in New York in Chicago in Miami in California in Hawaii I have actually two in London and industry is different in different places so you need to do that research and like you know who are the agents uh, who are uh, the top people you know the top venues to perform for what's happening in the industry um, again mp3 albums digital streaming staying atop of all that um, I was amazed I had a, a gentleman audition for me an uh, older gentleman very very talented and I said, you know, bring your port, uh, show me your portfolio. And of course, most portfolios are online. And of course, he didn't know what he didn't even know uh, how to do a website. He didn't even have email. I mean, like most people today have email, but he didn't even know what email was or how to set that up. Uh, just simple things. We, a lot of people, younger people, take for granted, like iPods. These things. A lot of older artists maybe haven't, uh, you know, learned. Um, and so this gentleman came in with a cassette tape. I mean, you know, who uses that anymore? And, uh, you know, just was like, well, I don't want to have to learn a computer. I don't want to have to do uh, a website. I don't want to have to do email. I don't want to have to use a cell phone, you know. I'm like, well, I'm sorry, sir, but uh, that's the industry. And so even if, so if you don't like it, uh, good luck to you, you know. But he wasn't willing to uh, embrace those changes. And I understand that's hard, even for myself. I remember uh, just many years ago going from a PC to a Mac, and I was like, well, I ever learned this, you know. And we all go through that, or we get a new cell phone, and we're like, oh, God, will I ever learn all these apps and so forth. But those who do are more efficient, obviously. So that's very, very important. And that's one thing I also teach is how to be very efficient in this industry and make contacts very, very quickly. Uh, and to um, multitask and network. It's very, very important. But we have to be willing to embrace change. It's hard. It was one of my hardest lessons, too, being originally a college professor in a nine to five job and that sort of lifestyle and then becoming completely self employed, which I love. It's so much better. And in fact, just for myself, I can honestly say that I work half the hours I worked uh, as a full time college professor. And I make more than what I make as a college professor. It's really interesting. And so where the world's going, I feel, people, is to self-employment. And the cool thing, you know, we get to do what we love to do. So if you're a singer, embrace that. You get to do what you love. But then you have to be willing to do the networking and the hard work it takes to stay connected in the industry. The easiest thing to do is actually getting up and singing. Uh, for most people, the hardest is taking the time to learn industry. And what a lot of people think is, well, I'm in college, so I'm going to get it there. And they go into vocal degrees, and they have not one lesson in, you know, contractual law, uh, studio policies, in, you know, how agents work, and how studios work, and then they wonder why they can't find a job. And it's really tragic. I mean, I know incredible singers that have, you know, masters in music and they're waiting tables. And it doesn't have to be that way, okay? So that's what I'm trying to stress to singers out there is embrace and study the industry. Okay, let's move on. Thank you.
Okay, this goes without saying, but the best singers know the right repertoire for their voice. And uh, specifically, this is so important for my singers uh, or that are in musical theater. So musical theater artists, actors, actresses out there, listen up. Um, knowing what to sing for an audition is either going to get you the part or not. Simple, okay? And what a lot of singer, beginner singers do is they just sing what they like. You know, like I have so many, you know, 14-year-old kids that, for example, love Wicked. I do too. It's a great musical. But, you know, not every 14-year-old kid is ready to sing Defying Gravity. You know what I mean? And a lot of people just audition with the wrong material. And it's just, it's a nightmare. And I see it every day and I'm like, oh my God. So you need to know what's right for your voice and your look and your personality. Here's an example. Um, I did a lot of Broadway shows uh, uh, back in my 20s and 30s. And, you know, I am, my uh, family background is on my mother's side is uh, Galician Spanish. And I looked that, you know, I have dark hair and so forth. So obviously I'm not going to do well auditioning for Sound of Music, which is all, you know, Germanic, uh, you know, Aust uh, Austrian blondes, right? But, you know, so that would just go with common sense. You know, obviously, if you're white, you don't, you know, audition for Porgy and Bess, you know. But you'd be surprised how many people don't know that. And, uh, you know, so knowing the right repertoire for your voice um, is very important. And to not be offended by, um, like, well, I should be able to sing that because I like the song. Com uh, you know, industry's going to, you know, Again, if you're in musical theater specifically, the look is everything. And you might have the perfect voice, but it might not be what they're looking for. So again, knowing uh, strategies on what song's gonna get you the part is important. But for industry artists, it's also knowing if you do cover songs, what styles uh, you can branch into. Um, I'm working with a very talented R&B artist right now who's got just insane high notes. and. And, and, you know, we were looking at material for his first demo because he can do a lot of different styles. And then, you know, we go, oh, that song's going to, you know, probably be good for him. And then I heard it and I went, absolutely not. It just, you know, cheapened him. And we got the right material. And it's just like, it's just like you know, amazing the shift and how then the agencies want to pick him up and so forth. So, um, again, knowing your material is very important. And then again, that's why it's good to work with a coach who has the industry experience to lead you in the right direction. I also believe in keeping a repertoire list. That means every song that you've ever performed and you know from memory, you need to keep a log of it because eventually it's going to come back and your agent's going to call you up and say, uh, hey, I need you to sing some Burt Bacharach from the 70s or I need you to do a, a, a 1930s show of Cole Porter. And if you don't know who those people are or what you do, then you're really at a loss. So also, I believe in addition to knowing the repertoire, a lot of that is historical study. And I make all my artists do that. So um, if I have a, you know, a musical theater artist, they better know the history of musical theater. And if I have an opera singer that's working with me, they better know every genre of opera and the classical periods of music. And if you're an R&B singer, you better know the history of R&B and the artists out there. And doesn't matter if you're, even if you're a rapper, you better know the industry and, and the history. And it's amazing how many people don't. I'm going to tell you a funny story that is actually very tragic, but I, I still tell this as hysterical. So I had a mother very nice lady, brought her very talented son to me to work with. Uh, and he was a 12-year-old who got cast in the musical Oliver at the Pantages Theater, very prestigious. And the mother came in and said to me, my son got cast in Oliver, can you start with him working on the songs? And I said, absolutely, has he read Charles Dickens? And the mother actually said to me, is that the director? I was like, Oh my God, are you kidding me? The same lady actually said to me, too, um, we're going to go see a new movie, and it was basically Leo DiCaprio and Great Gatsby. I'm like, hello, you never heard of F. Scott Fitzgerald, you know? You never heard of uh, Robert Redford, who did the original movie, you know? And um, I, 
this woman, by the way, I would never hurt someone's feelings. I, I asked her if I'd be allowed to talk about this. So I'm not using her name or anything. So just let you know, I would never uh, debase, a, you know, a client or anything. But anyway, um, but that's what I'm talking about. The sad thing is there is absolutely very little education in uh, the arts and in, uh, in music history in the schools. And so a lot of people are just ignorant. And, I, I, you know, I don't want to sound snobbish, but that's just the truth. And so the more you know uh, the history of what you're singing and so forth, the better you're going to do in the industry and the more people are going to rely, you know, want to hire you. Okay, so it's very, very important. I can't stress it enough. Okay, let's move on. Okay, we're back. And um, number nine, I cannot stress enough, is the power of networking. And um, it's amazing how many people just don't network. They expect like, you know, they just complain and like, I don't know why I can't find a, an engagement and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, you have to be out there. And um, there's a lot of uh, techniques that I teach uh, artists for being booksellers. No reason in any industry where they say, oh, it's slow or there's no more uh, venues or whatever, uh, that's really bull. You can find work and you can create work. And that's what I try to teach is that. But the way to do that is that it's really about network marketing. and. Um, Everywhere you go, you have to be thinking that's a potential opportunity to talk about your services as, a, as an artist. Um, so it uh, goes without saying you should always have uh, business cards on you and not only on you, in your home, in your car. Uh, you should have uh, brochures of what you do. Uh, your website, but it can be anywhere. Like, you know, I picked up a, a new client the other day just running down uh, to dinner with a friend. I'm just sitting down and have uh, talking with a friend, and I hear this lady behind me says, well, I got to get my daughter to class because she's getting ready for the musical. And I heard, oh, musical. Oh, really? Your daughter's in musicals. How great is that? And what school did you go to? And we started talking. And all of a sudden, she's like, oh, my God, I'm looking for a vocal coach for her. Great. Here's my number. So that's uh, really important is um, networking. Also, the use of multiple agents if you are a singer. It's a numbers game. So you should have your professional portfolio and every agent you can get into. Let them do the work and find you engagement. And it's amazing how many people don't go to the problem, uh, the the you know, they don't do that. They, they just complain and say, oh, well, you know, I don't know if I'm good enough yet or I don't know what's needed or, um, you know, so forth. And then, well, you're never going to make it. The trick is you have to get out there. Now, this is the interesting thing is most artists, a lot of them are shy people and they and, you know, they express themselves emotionally through their music. I'm one of those kind of people. I'm actually a very quiet person. I performed in front of millions of people. I performed at Hollywood Bowl in front of thousands and things like that. And, and you know, but if I was to ask what I love to do, I like intimacy. I like working one-on-one. -on -one, and that's why I do what I do, you know. But what I'm getting at is um, if you are going to be a performer, you have to get good at talking with people and practicing your craft and knowing where to go. And here's two rules. Go where the money is, number one. Makes sense. If you live in a small town, uh, you know, you need to get into the big city, meaning your chances of connecting, uh, you know, like if you're, at, like I'm just using my, uh, my neighborhood as an example. So I live in Long Beach, is a pretty, um, you know, international city and part of LA County. But let's say I lived in Orange County in a smaller, you know, a city like Fountain Valley. Well, you know, nice city, suburbs, but it's not where the money is. You're probably going to do better to network going down to Newport Beach, Laguna. And so that's number one is, is go where the money is. Also, where you choose to live as a singer is going to affect the money you make. So obviously, if you live in a rural town somewhere, you know, uh, 
you know, you need you need to consider moving closer to a big city or where industry is. Um, goes without saying. Um, there's a reason I live in the area I live in. I, I live in a beautiful, I'm actually in Rock Hudson's old condo, and I live right on the ocean in Long Beach. I'm convenient to the freeways. I can cruise up to LA very easily. I can get into Orange County very easily. And so I'm centrally located, and that has really helped my business grow. And so that's something I suggest. The other thing is um, dress for success and dress for the industry you're in. So if you're, um, you know, you're a classical singer, you know, you probably need to have a tux, you know, if you're a male or a gown. And if you're uh, a rock singer, you have to have those, ed you know, the edgier look. So dress for what you're, you're trying to get, okay? And that goes without saying. But it's amazing how many people don't know those simple things of like what colors look best on you or uh, you know, uh, women knowing how to do their makeup, things like that. So that's another thing we do here in artist development is work on the whole package, so to speak. Um, I had a singer um, the other day, very lovely girl I work with, who um, has a lot of acne. And I just said, well, you know what? You want that album cover to look bang on, so you need to work on your skin. And she felt at first a little offended. Well, you know, but then she did it and she go, oh, my God, I do look better. You're absolutely right. My album cover looks amazing and I'm glad I listened to you, you know. So it is about physicality in this industry. And uh, so you want to, like I said, present yourself the best you can. Okay, let's move on to the last one. Okay, thanks for staying with me. And here is number 10, and it really is important, is you need to program your body, mind, and spirit for success. Here's the way the universe works, people, is your thoughts are creating your reality. So if you have that in the background of, well, I don't know if I'm good enough, then guess what? You're not good enough. Simple. Here's another one I hear all the time. Well, I don't have enough money for coaching. I don't have enough money to go into a studio. It's too expensive. It's too hard. On and on. Okay. Here's the thing, though, is if you put it out there to the universe, um, what you want, and you hold to it, the universe is going to give you what, what you want. And this, I think was the greatest lesson my parents told me and I'm so blessed to have had industry parents that you know when I was four and five years old and I was playing uh, classical piano they would say well little Jimmy you know you can play anything you want you can play Mozart so I go yeah of course I could play Mozart and you know when I was 12 and you know my you know I had a teacher that, that said well Rhapsody in Blue by Gershwin is too hard for you I said I can do it you know, and I was debuting with the with the symphony at age twelve. You know, so it's it's about you have to believe in yourself, and we all have negative conditioning. Um, one that was mine, which I will share with you, is even though I came from a musical family, uh, my father grew up in the depression, so he had some fears concerning making a, a living fully um, as a musician. So I always heard as a child that music is not practical. Music's not a real job. Music is bohemian. You know, you, you, you probably have heard a lot of these yourself, or maybe you think these yourself. Um, and that kind of conditioning will not get you anywhere. And it was really interesting when I was starting out as a teacher back in my, um, I actually started teaching in my teens, I couldn't figure it out why I couldn't, you know, keep a lot of students. And that was part of my conditioning. Music's not a real job. Well, interestingly enough, once I changed my conditioning, you know, I'm, you know, I love what I do. I'm, I'm, I feel I'm, you know, successful and I, you know, I don't, you know, I have a lot of freedom in my life. And that can be you too. And I really wish that for, for singers, that you have that artistic freedom to create and love what you do and uh, to make great money doing what you do. But it starts with the spiritual work. 
Um, one of my greatest teachers is a dear friend of mine. Um, he's my doctor, my holistic doctor. Um, his name is Dr. Alan Arnett, uh, the Advanced Wellness Center here in Long Beach. And I would go into him with uh, my physical ailments that would come up occasionally and my emotional issues and, uh, you know, or things I was working on. And he always says uh, in his lovely voice, a little grasshopper, go back to your meditation. And he was absolutely right. It's all about, um, you know, quieting your mind, staying in that now moment and putting your intention out. Um, a book I use with my students that I highly recommend that can really be helpful for those artists that might be struggling with money fears or am I good enough or how do I get started or, you know, uh, image issues, things like that. Um, the book I use is called The Artist Way by Julia Cameron. Um, I actually toured with her doing a lot of her workshops and it's a 12-week work course to work through um, any emotional blocks that keep you towards your higher creativity. And I highly recommend that and that's the hard work. And what I see, which is so sad, is a lot of talented people that just give up too soon. And they oh and it's always their mental conditioning. You know, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not good enough, you know, I don't look like Beyonce, I don't look like, you know, uh, whatever, you know, I hear all of this all day long and I'm like, you know what, there is a market for everyone and, you know, you have to embrace your inner beauty, you know. So, um, anyway, I hope these 10 uh, things we talked about today help you get started and I truly wish every singer out there the very best in the industry and if you happen to live in a uh, uh, Southern California in LA, Orange, or Riverside County, uh, feel free to visit my website, jamesrspencer.com, or uh, my phone number uh, for my uh, firm is 562-394-2694. Feel free to call me. Um, I love working with new artists. I book up very quickly, so I only have about five openings for this fall, but I do have other Phenomenal, uh, phenomenal industry teachers that work with me that um, also handle uh, you know my company here. Um, the other thing too is if you're in a, a rural area but would like some uh, or out of the state, I also offer um, and my teachers offer Skype lessons, so it's another option. Um, or of course you can always research um, you know artist developers and uh, vocal coaches in your area. Well, thank you so much uh, for st uh, visiting me today. And again, I wish you all well. And this is uh, J.R. Spencer, James Spencer from Spencer Music and Artist Development. Uh, and then again, wishing you all great luck in your careers. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care.